to have town, town, East Chester Town Councilwoman Sheila Marcotte, who is a very, very good friend of seniors, with us today. And you, we've always heard it's the busiest person who gets everything done. She has young children. I don't know where she gets her energy, and I don't even think she sleeps, but <laughs> she goes. Over the weekend, a friend of mine who lives in Westchester, in an apartment building, high on a hill, got the renewal form on his homeowner's insurance. And he said, I want you to see this. And in big red letters, it was warnings about flood insurance. <laughs> and so part of what Sheila is going to talk about, or refer to a little bit today, is that terrible storm last spring and the Marble House, uh, Marble Schoolhouse collection. So, Sheila. Yeah. Uh, you want me to speak into this? Can everybody hear me? Yeah. 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 I have to use this. It's a yeah. All right. It's a little hard to hear. Okay. Uh, <laughs> what? No. <laughs> All right. Happy New Year, everybody. Thank nice you. to be here. Thank you. And a good one. Um, and a good one and a healthy one. Absolutely. I am here representing the East Chester Historical Society, and I am a trustee there, and I have been one for four years. And I am also what they call a docent. Uh, and a docent is uh, a teacher that teaches in the Marble Schoolhouse. And usually what happens is the younger students come down, they come to the schoolhouse, and they sit in the desks, they hold the slates, and I talk to them about what it was like to have been a, a child attending the Marble Schoolhouse in 1835. Uh, it's, it's a great experience for them. They love it. They get to you know see and touch and feel and look at everything. We're not also just uh, a schoolhouse and a you know an education center, but we're also classified as a museum. So part of our responsibility is to educate the younger group. So um, I do enjoy speaking to people your age because when I speak to the younger kids, uh, you know every now and then I'll stop and I'll say, does anybody have a question? And the hand always goes up and they go, did you go to school here? <laughs> so I know you're not going to ask me that. I did not attend school. Thank you. I did not go to school in 1835. So, the Marble Schoolhouse. How many of you know where it's located? Everybody. Just a few. All right, I have a picture here. I also have an assistant with me, former mayor, Phil White. Uh, this is a picture of the Marble Schoolhouse. As many of you know, it's located on the corner of California and New Rochelle Road. Phil's going to pass that around. It was built in 1835, and as you know, it's called the Marble Schoolhouse because it is made all of marble, Tuckahoe marble, to be exact. So at that time, as you know, the quarries were up and running, very successful, and at the time it was probably, obviously, the most available uh, building resource as well as the cheapest for them to build a school for the children. Now, originally, uh, it's, it's not in its original location, I should say. It was built about a mile and a half down the road on uh, Route 22 and East Devonia Avenue. It was built there in 1835. In 1864, it was moved. And I'm told how they moved it was they literally took it apart piece by piece, stone by stone, floorboard, window, and they assigned a number to every piece. And they probably put it on the uh, the back of a horse-drawn carriage, or perhaps a carriage drawn by some oxen. Pulled it down the road, and then rebuilt it. And it remained open till about 1884, and then it closed. So the building in itself is 173 years old. Um, it has been restored, pretty much to exactly how it would have appeared in 1835. 
A um, lot of the things that are in the building were actually donated by residents in the area. And what happened was, the building was owned by a man, a gentleman by the name of Samuel Klepford. And Samuel Klepford owned the land on which the building sits. Now, Samuel Klepford was a pig farmer. That's when all the kids laugh, it was a pig farmer. They think it's very funny that the entire land was covered with pigs roaming through Chester Heights. <laughs> The, the building itself was used to actually store and house uh, feed for the animals, uh, perhaps farming equipment, that type of thing. So when Mr. Klepford passed away, he turned the building, and it had then been reduced to just a, you know, a sliver of land in the area, and he gave it to the town of East Chester, and the town of East Chester, in turn, turned it over to the Historical Society. So they, they, they had received this, this beautiful school that was in absolutely awful condition and they had no money. They were in a little bit of a pickle, so what they did was they turned to the residents. Tuckahoe, Bronxville, East Chester, they reached out to everybody, especially the merchants. They reached out to you know uh, painters and carpenters, if you owned a hardware store, if you were a plumber, an electrician, and they came out in droves. And they volunteered labor, and they volunteered material, and they helped to restore the building to virtually no charge to the historical society. Then there was the task of actually um, putting you know, desks and chairs and acquiring all those things. So again, the community was very generous. They went into their basements, they went into their attics, and they came out with all sorts of books and artifacts and old toys and clothing, you name it. We have it all down there. We have a very extensive, extensive excuse me, collection of books, <coughs> documents, manuals, manuscripts. Uh, we have a, a very large collection of clothing. Some of the clothing, some of the gowns we have date back to the Civil War era, and I'll wow. talk about that a little later. Um, we've got children's toys. Uh, we furnished, we were able to furnish the building itself with antique desks that were acquired from a one-room schoolhouse in Vermont. The stove that was, um, you know, of its time of the era 1800s was also taken from a one-room schoolhouse in Vermont. And we have a teacher's desk that was taken from a one-room schoolhouse in Connecticut. Now, other than that, everything is from the area. There's a large bookcase there that came from the Masterton estate. Uh, there are books in it that belonged to Mr. Masterton himself. We have a collection of christening dresses that came from the Masterton estate. So there's a lot of items in it that are of uh, local importance and have a rich history. So, a lot of people ask the question, and this is a great question, because when you walk into the schoolroom, you look at the setup, I think most people associate a schoolroom with desks being set up in a row, facing the teacher. Uh, not so in this building. The desks are set up to the left and to the right. The children came in, the girls sat on one side, the boys sat on another side. Uh, the teacher taught from a teaching platform elevated about eight inches off the ground. She had one desk, or he had one desk. I should tell you there were 15 teachers who taught there. Uh, Ten of them were male, five of them were female. You were not allowed to be married if you were a teacher there. And it wasn't until the late, about 1870s, that you were allowed to teach if you were married. So I get the question, how do you know that this is what it looked like? And that's a great question, how do I know? I mean, I wasn't around, you weren't around. In, eight, in 1959, rather, when we took it over, those people certainly weren't around. And interestingly enough, going back into the 1940s or so, somebody in the East Chester Historical Society or someone who had a, uh, a love of history had the presence of mind to seek out students who were still around who may have attended school. And they found two people, a Mr. Betru of Bronxville and Mr. Archer. And Mr. Archer lived over in Chester Heights. And if you're familiar with that area, there was an Archer Drive named after Mr. Archer. And so those two gentlemen sat down, and they sat down with someone who took down all of their thoughts, their memoirs, their memories. And so we know what a day in the life was like of a student because of these two gentlemen. So we know that the girls sat on one side and the boys sat on the other side. We know how the day went. Now, the day started at 9 o'clock in the morning. It's very similar to how our school is set up now. Our kids go a little earlier, some at 8, some at 8.30, but for the most part, school was 9 to 3. At 8.30 in the morning, the teacher would open up the building. Now, the teacher usually had with him or her several assistants, and the assistants would be usually the older students, uh, maybe the 7th or the 8th graders. And I should tell you that the school only had students from 1st to 8th grade. 
That's it. There was no, you know, junior pre-K, pre-K, K. You were not ready to go to school till you were in the first grade. So the teacher would open up the building at 8:30. And she would, the, there was, there still is, by the way, a bell in the, 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 the belfry on top of the building. Someone would ring that bell at 830, and that bell could be heard for a very great, great distance. What that told you was, if you were walking, and most of you walked to school if you went to school there, you knew when you heard the bell, it was 830, and you better hurry up. School was going to start in half an hour. Nine o'clock, she would open the door, and she would ring a handbell. And the students who if it was nice out, they would be out on the lawn behind or in front, and they would know nine o'clock school would begin and they would file in. Now the helpers would come early to help her. There were many things to do before school and after school. One of the things that had to be done was the water buckets had to be filled. There, there was, there still is um, an area on the front lawn where the well used to be, and there's a cement block there now. But there was a well there, and behind the building, there was a stream that ran all the way around. Now the stream is long gone. Um, we know it's still underground because, because of the flood we had in April. Um, so they would fill the water buckets, and there would be two water buckets. One was for drinking out of, and the other one was for washing your hands. Now, if it was a cold day, they would have to start the wood stove. Now, if you went to school at the Marble Schoolhouse, every student there was responsible to bring one week's <coughs> worth of cut wood. Your caregiver, your grandmother, your, whoever lived with you and took care of you, would help you get one week's worth of cut wood to the schoolhouse. And hopefully that would ensure that you would get through a very cold winter. So it, it, you know, it wasn't very well insulated, although marble in itself is an excellent insulator. But there was the only one source of heat. Now when the Historical Society took over the building, they had to do a couple things. Number one, to get museum status. Can anybody guess? They had to do three things. Does anybody want to guess the three things they had to put into the building? Light. Light. Plumbing, because there was no bathrooms, there was an outhouse. No insulation, electricity, and the plumbing. What's the third? Well, the, the bathroom and the electricity and the heat, so that, that's really the three things, because there was no heat. Um, there was an outhouse in the back, and the children, if they had to go to the restrooms, they had to go in behind the building. So those are the three things. The schoolhouse has, if you look at the picture that Phil passed around, there are, they're open there, but there are green shutters. Yeah. And the shutters are on all the windows all around the building. And it served two purposes. Number one, to protect the window and the glass. But also in the winter, it would keep the cold air out and keep the heat in. So it would, would be very, very cold in there. The teacher would teach by candlelight. There'd be a few candles around the room. And then later on, towards the end, uh, right before it closed, the introduction of you know, kerosene lamps were brought into the schoolhouse. So let me just see now. Now, I'm going to pass around, I know you've seen this, but these are just some pictures of some quarries from the area and a piece of marble. Okay. Anybody have any questions right now? Yes, Sheila. What was their thinking about not having the, the um, teachers marry? Uh, you know, I don't know, and there's no documentation on that. Uh, this, the teachers also, by the way, this, the students always cringe when I tell them this, but the teachers would live with the students for six months out of the year. So for six months they'd live with one family, and then another six months they'd move on to the oh, to another family. The and that's possible that that would be part of the reason. So you know there were no apartment ha houses per se. There were no um, you know place motels or anything for them to stay in. One thing interestingly enough, how many of you remember Fisher's Tavern? Oh yeah, Alice. Okay, Fisher's Tavern was located on the corner. Right. And around the same time that the Historical Society was receiving the building. Uh, they were doing a road widening project. And so that the road that is there now was going to be widened and paved and so forth. So Fisher's Tavern had to be torn down to facilitate that project. Eminent Domain took over and so forth. Now the owners of Fisher's Tavern contacted the owners of the Historical Society and said to them, if there's anything from our building that you need to help restore your building, come and take it. And that really worked out well for the Historical Society because when you go in the Marble Schoolhouse, the wood floor, it's a, it's a wide plank wood floor that's down now, is the original floor from Fisher's Tavern. And Fisher's Tavern was built in 1835 as well. We have doors, I think there's three doors total, that also came from Fisher's Tavern. Now Fisher's Tavern, for those of you who don't know, 
it was a stop on the Redbird stagecoach, and the Redbird stagecoach ran from Danbury to New York City. Uh, it took you know, probably about 12 to 15 hours. So it would stop halfway, and you could get a room upstairs in Fisher's Tavern because it was an inn. And one of the doors we have in the back of the schoolhouse actually has a number nine on it. And it's the original door from room number nine in Fisher's Tavern. So we also have all of the hardware and all of the locks came from Fisher's Tavern. So they, they did do an excellent job and played a very important role in helping to, uh, to renovate it. Okay. Pardon me as I go through my notes here. Okay. A typical day. The day would start at 9 a.m. after everything was prepared, the heat was on, the candles were lit, the slates were cleaned, the water buckets were filled. Nine o'clock, the students would come in. And the very first thing they did was they stood up and they said the Pledge of Allegiance. After the Pledge of Allegiance, the next thing that the teacher would do, or perhaps her assistant, uh, she would read some scriptures from the Bible. Every teacher had a Bible on the desk. It, it was a standard part of the curriculum. It was the first thing you did after the Pledge of Allegiance was you read from scripture. If you were fortunate enough to have a teacher uh, that had some musical abilities and had what they call a melodeon. I don't have one to show you. They're very rare, but it's about the size of a small piano. The teacher would play some, uh, probably church songs, on the melodeon, and that would be the only form you know, of music that the students would get. After that, the day would begin, and the teacher, she taught, she stood or sat from a teacher's platform. And then directly in front of the platform, there would be three or four chairs. Now, if you're teaching first to eighth grade, there were probably at any given time, maybe 25 to 30 students in the classroom. There were probably four or five students a grade. So the first grade, if there were three students, would come up and they would sit down in the, the little chairs in front of the teacher, and the teacher would teach the first grade. Now during this time, it was very important for everybody else to be very quiet. There was no talking, no laughing, no giggling. You, you, you did the work or the assignment you had maybe from the day before, you studied your lesson, and the first grade would carry on. When the first grade was done, they would return to their seats, and the second grade would come up. This is how it would go on all day until she finally got to the eighth grade. They did have lunch. They did have a recess. Uh, they brought their lunch to the school. They didn't go home, unless maybe they lived really close, but this was the only schoolhouse you know, for a great distance because East Chester at that time encompassed parts of New Rochelle, Mount Vernon, um, a fair amount of the Bronx area. So students traveled a great distance to come. So if you came there, you brought your lunch, and it would be carried to school in something like this. Anybody know what this was or is? Lunch pail. A lunch pail. Right, pail. It's an old lard container. And this would be something that maybe your grandmother or your mother or somebody would cook with. And when the lard was gone, you would clean it up and you would put your lunch in there. Now, I'm just going to pass this down. I wonder how much beer That's right. If you had a larger family, maybe there were three or four or five kids from one family, your mother would pack your lunch in a, in a big basket and you'd bring your lunch to school in the basket. Now they had a recess. Um, at, you know, if it was nice outside, they would play outside. Again, there was a stream in the back. Uh, on a hot day, I suppose, they would take their shoes and socks off, wet their toes. Sometimes, a, but I won't say a bad boy, but a naughty student might sneak a frog in. <laughs> and this was a bad thing. And even though they had punishments, which I'm going to have Phil, Where's my assistant? I'm going to pass this out. This is a list of punishments that were common to a school room. But one of the worst punishments that you could have, and it's not on this list, does anybody know what they would do? It would be considered very humiliating. The students would love this. You can pass one out. I have only about 30. Hopefully there's enough. Okay. You would be sent to the dunce chair. Did you say that? And you wore the dunce cap. And you, or you would stand in the corner, but you had to wear that big, tall, pointed dunce cap, and that was really considered, you know, now if I, when I bring the students and I'll say, you know, can I have a volunteer, and 12 hands will go up, and they think it's great. They giggle and they laugh. But, it, you know, it was not so back then. That was an awful thing to have to do, to sit in a corner and, you know, sort of a fool in a way, but... And then after lunch, they would come back and they would just continue through the day learning their lessons. School would end at 3 o'clock 
and the students would go home. There was no aftercare. Um, you probably didn't get a lot of homework at the time because you had other things to do. The students went home to help their families. They were, you know, they were farming. They had chores to do around the farm. Some students would stay and help to close up the schoolhouse. Now, recess and lunch was a great opportunity time for students to seek extra help from the teacher because again, three o'clock came and you went home. Now, on a rainy day or a cold day, they would spend that time indoors, and there was not, you know, Toys R Us wasn't down the street, Best Buy wasn't in business, so you know, you didn't have all the games and gadgets that our kids have today. So some of the things they would do, they would spend time making toys. Uh, this would be an example of something that maybe a young lady would work on. And this is just, uh, it's made out of like a leathery material. It's all hand stitched, uh, very lovingly made. It's missing one eye. But you know, a child would have loved this. And this is something that the girls would have practiced making because they would need to learn how to stitch and how to sew. There were other toys that they made. Everybody know what these are? Can you see them? Well, these are corn husk dolls. And I'll pass them around and you'll notice when you take the husk off the corn and it's green, but when it dries, it turns to this brown color and it makes a very pliable and durable item to make a toy out of. So somebody very clever came up with the corn husk doll and that would be the type of doll that a young lady would play with or a young lady would make. This would be, you know, boys, some of the things they would have to learn how to do is how to whittle wood because they would make their own toys. So this is just a very simple little toy that was whittled by a boy. It's very old. I'm going to pass it around. But that would, you know, entertain a youngster. And my boys would last like two seconds with this, but that is what they did. Now, some of the other things that they did for entertainment, you can just put them all right there, thanks, honey. Has, did anybody oh, yeah. know or have oh, you seen? Yes. 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 Well, yeah, we had these growing up, they were called kaleidoscopes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But these date back to the early 1800s, and this is called a stereoctopin. Now, I'll pass this around, you can all look at it. What it is, if you look here, there's a picture. And it's the same picture, but it's, it's double on both sides. On the back of this, it will tell you all about the scene that you're looking at. So not only was this a fun thing to do, because when you look through here, and you can move this, you can, you can adjust it for your sight, this picture becomes 3D. So you could look at it, but it was a great way to learn about the country, or perhaps other countries, and you would have a stack of these cards. Every family had them. You know, there wasn't a TV, but every family had this on their, their parlor table, if you will. And you had a stack of cards, and everybody looked at one card, then you switched the card. This was a very, very popular item. You can adjust it with the little thing underneath. And they, there wasn't a great deal of paper. You were, you were lucky if you had paper. So most of the students wrote on a slate. Now this is a reproduction, it's not very old, but this is what it looked like. And you would write your lesson on it, show your teacher it, you were able to erase it. Every student had one of these at their desks. Another popular form of educating the young, this is called a horn book. And it's not an original. Uh, this is a reproduction, but it's a very good reproduction. This is exactly what someone who went to school during that era would have. And what they did was, and uh, well, why they called it a horn book, I'll tell you that to begin with. This white, what appears to be paper, was actually made from the horn of an animal. They took the horns, they melted it down until it became very liquidy, and then they would smooth it onto a piece of wood, and it would harden. And when it dried, they would write with a plastic. feather pen. And like a plastic. <laughs> right. They would write on it with a feather pen and ink, because they had to make their own ink. And ink was made out of your know, wild berries and nuts, whatever was in the area. And that would be a job of the teacher as well as her assistants. They would write on the horn book. Now, this one has the alphabet, and it has some scripture. And this horn book would stay you know, in the classroom till basically everybody had a chance to read it and study it. When it was no longer of use for that particular class, the teacher would simply melt down some more horn, 
and go right over this. So it, over time, there'd be a great deal of you know, layers. I'm going to pass this around, but I warn you, it's a little bit heavy. It is now. <laughs> it wasn't then. And they could probably use it as a paddle. It, it was not uncommon for a teacher to be able to strike a student. Um, a teacher would have a pointer, and the pointer would be a long, thin strip of wood. Okay, see, one second. And it, it would be dual, you know, two purposes. The teacher could use it to point, you know, Faye, what's the answer? Or they could point at the map. But they were also used, allowed to use the pointer to give lashes. And when you're, what you're reading right now, it's the number of lashes that were assigned for you know, whatever bad thing you did. But that's what they would use the pointer for. Did you have a question? No. Um, does anybody have a question right now? <laughs> yeah, that's one of the higher ones. You can keep those if you'd like. Does anybody want to take a guess at what this is? It's made out of metal. It's a cylinder with a top and a bottom. Not to put your pens in. It's got little holes. Something in here. It's not a spool of thread. It had something to do with ink. Not an ink well. This was called a sander. Because if you did have paper, if you were fortunate enough to be able to do your lesson on paper, as you, when you write down, you don't know, but when you write with a, a feather pen and dip it in ink, the paper can become very wet. And there would be like little pools of ink on the paper. You don't want to hand that in. You want to hand in a nice dry assignment. So this is called a sander. This would be filled with sand. And when you were done with your assignment, you would simply sprinkle the sand on the paper, wait for it to dry, and then you would brush it off, and then you could turn in your assignment. So that was a very common item to have when you were writing with an inkwell and a feather pen. One of the, another one of the duties of the teacher was, um, and if you had a lot of kids, this would probably take you a long time, but one responsibility of the teacher was to fashion a feather pen for every student in her or his classroom, craft. and craft it, yeah. and all of them had different, you know, different likes in terms of how they wanted the point. You know, for example, you might like to write with a fine point. You might prefer a broad point. So the teacher would have to craft the, the quill, the very end of the feather, to your like that you're comfortable with writing. So there were a lot of jobs the teacher had to do. Now this. Anybody want to guess? Ice skates. It's a very, very old pair of ice skates made out of wood. And I'll pass these around. They would be, you can see that there are holes in the side. This would be strapped right onto the bottom of your shoe. Very old pair. We have several of these. We have them um, out of metal, different types of wood. Where did you get them, Sheila? Did people donate? All of these items were donated by the residents. That's a great question. Thank uh -huh. you. Everything in the schoolhouse has been donated. Very few items have been purchased. Now, if you went to school there, and you were a young lady, and usually I call up one of the girls to model, and they love that. But this would be an example of what you would wear on a cold day. Just a basic shawl over your dress, if it was very cold out, you might wear something like this. This is just an old quilted hat. And the girls would wear that. They would wear sunbonnets when it was sunny out to protect their skin from the sun. Now, sorry, I'm getting tangled up here. At the end of the year, you would have a promotion ceremony. And if you were lucky enough, to have a, you know, received a passing grade from your teacher, you were what they called promoted to the next grade. And they had a ceremony of sorts. And all of your, your parents and your grandparents and your aunts and your uncles, whoever you wanted, would come to the schoolhouse. They would sit in the schoolhouse and the students would now all sit on one side together. And they would have to stand up one by one and recite um, you know, all sorts of various lessons, whatever the teacher had asked them to memorize, asked them to recite. And if they did a good job, they were promoted. They didn't get a report card. What they received from the teacher, see, I've got a couple of them. It's called a reward of merit. 
and that was made out in your name. That was proof that you were to be promoted to the next grade. And every student would get one of these in order to go into the next class. Pass that around, will you? Now, um, I don't know how many of you have ever been down there during the Christmas holiday, but during Christmas, I know Allison and Taylor are always down there. They do set up the schoolhouse in a Victorian display. And we have a, a large Christmas tree that we put on the teacher's platform. We move the furniture around and so forth. And the Christmas tree itself is decorated head to toe in Victorian Christmas items. Uh, a fair amount of these items were donated by the Masterton estate. And what happened was that, um, I believe it was after the Mastertons had sold the estate, whoever one of the newer owners were had found a box of ornaments in the attic and they turned them over to the Historical Society. So we do have a, a very large collection of Christmas ornaments that came from the Masterton estate. Most of them are handmade. They're all Victorian. I'm going to pass around these pictures. This is one of the Christmas tree. I don't know if June can see that. There's also a nice sort of panoramic view of the Christmas display. I think it's still up there on the eastchester.org website. And if you click on events and recent photos, you can look at those. This would be another picture. We have a, a large amount of Victorian dolls. Now, sadly enough, a lot of these dolls were taken, this picture was taken last year. Some of these dolls uh, we no longer have anymore because they were completely ruined in the flood. And I'll tell you about that in one second, and this is just another picture. This is actually, I don't know if you can see it, but this little red velvet outfit that's hanging, it's got a matching pair of red shoes, there's a, a little tambourine with red ribbon. That would be a Christmas outfit for a little boy. And that actually came from Bronxville. These are just some extra that copies of newspaper articles. Pass those around. Anybody have any questions at this point? <laughs> no, the comment, can yes. you imagine our spoiled kids today, when they read these punishments, yeah, they're right? Stunned. They wouldn't be able faces. to survive. Yes. <laughs> Incredible. They're not they're when they read those. Yeah. I'm surprised that the one with playing cards. Uh, I, I, me too. I yes. just look like at gambling. Yeah. Yeah. That's <laughs> since forever. Well, they were, they were very strict back then. Yeah. Maybe this is what made me. So, I'll tell you about the play. Yes. Um, well, I, I told Barbara next year we will send a formal invitation to the Tuckahoe seniors to come down. <laughs> absolutely, yes. You can absolutely come down next year. We set it up the first weekend in December every year. And by all means, we'll have you all down as a group to come through. Because it's really quite a display. All under the Christmas tree are children's toys. Victorian and vintage children's toys. And so it's really... Now you would have to would have to some, provide some sort of transportation. But yes. No, and I'll tell you about that. Now, as many of you remember, there was a huge nor'easter that came through New York, uh, April the 15th and the 16th. And what happened was now there's the Marble Schoolhouse, and then behind the Marble Schoolhouse is the library. The library was built, I think, in 1979. It was an additional building that was built because we needed more storage space to house all of the books, all of the documents. Unfortunately, the dolls were in the basement of the library. And basically what happened was, it was a combination of the runoff, because if you know where the building is, it's really located on the lowest point of the property. So there was a fair amount of runoff, as well as rising groundwater. And it's the rising groundwater that really rushed the building. We had about a foot and a half. Uh, we lost a tremendous amount of books, some of which were salvageable. We're trying to have them restored. They're actually still in a freezer right now. They're in a freezer in an East Chester restaurant. The merchant was kind enough. But what happens is when books get wet and you're going to restore it, um, you can't let them dry because the mildew and mold process will begin. So until you're ready to have them professionally restored, the recommendation is to freeze them immediately. So we have a lot of books that are currently frozen solid. Um, and we are going to begin the restoration process on those that were salvageable. 
the dolls were ruined, and FEMA does, I have to say, FEMA was actually very generous and very kind to the Historical Society. We ended up receiving a little over $70,000. Wow. We had about $90,000 worth of damage, and the bulk of the damage was to the dolls. Now, FEMA is great in giving you money to renovate and to restore. They will not replace. And the dolls were damaged beyond repair. And some of these dolls go for two, three thousand dollars. So unless they were, you know, unless they, somebody was able to restore them, they, they literally disintegrated. Because most of them were a porcelain head, hand painted, and the rest would have been, you know, the, the, the torso of sorts would have been stuffed. They just disintegrated from the water. So there was nothing we could do. The heads are not Nothing. Some of the, the faces, you know, just from the moisture cracked. Uh, yeah. Porcelain. They're porcelain. I wouldn't, wouldn't think that they would deteriorate. Well, the paint crackled, bubbled, you know, so there wasn't a lot we could do. We did, however, get about $30,000 from FEMA to restore the dresses. And a great deal of our dresses were absolutely drenched, I mean, ruined. Water stained, you know, rust stained, um, the, the groundwater discolored. So right now, those are currently up at the um, the Northeast Textile Conservation Center, and those are going under full restoration. So we, we, in a way, we lucked out with regard to that because we're getting a large amount of our collection restored professionally. So we will benefit from that. Uh, we will have some of the books. We had a great contractor come in, uh, Mr. Flannery from Eastchester. He did a wonderful job in renovating the basement. And FEMA, again, they gave us $25,000 for that and an additional $10,000 for future flood mitigation efforts, which we, we have done. But, you know, they say something good comes out of something bad always. So and we, we were lucked out because our dresses will be restored. One of the things that happened, and I don't really think anybody knew that this was in the collection. It was sort of a surprise. Uh, there was a box, you know, the box was probably half the size of this table. It's about this, this deep, very heavy, and I remember the curator handing it to me saying, take this home and dry it, and, and I'm looking at it, and the box is like bleeding red and blue ink. It was filled with flags. The flags had gotten completely drenched. So we took the flags to my house, and my neighbor helped me. We had no choice but to lay them on the ground, uh, because some of them were the size of garrison flags. They were, you know, 8 by 14 feet long. You couldn't, you couldn't put them on a clothesline. You couldn't put them in a dryer. So my backyard, my neighbor's backyard were wall-to-wall -wall flags. Did the we, colors run into one another? The, the reds bled into the white for the most part. And you cannot get that out unless you have it done professionally. There's, and there were too many. But there was one flag that I turned over a couple times just, you know, because we were trying to get everything dried out. And I looked at it and I thought, well, oh, that's kind of funny looking. And I collect flags and I'm pretty familiar with the, the formation of the stars. So about the second day, I looked at this flag. I said, oh my goodness. I said, that's an odd number of stars. Well, long story short, it's a 30-star flag that was in our collection. It was mismarked. It said on the box that it was uh, from the Spanish-American War, which would, would date that flag to 1898. But the number of stars doesn't correlate to that. 30 stars goes back to 1848. So that makes it part of the, you know, right at the Mexican-American War. And upon closer examination, we discovered the entire flag was hand sewn. It's a real treasure. All the stars were hand cut. Everything is hand stitched. It, it had been lovingly taken care of by whoever its owner was because many holes had been repaired, patches had been placed over the stripes. So um, it, it's a wonderful addition to our collection. It's a rare piece, um, a flag of that nature, you know, unrestored goes for three or $4,000, fully restored, five, six, seven thousand. Wow. Uh, but you can't put a price tag on it because it's so rare. Uh, 1848 is a good nine years before the Singer sewing machine. So any flag prior to that had to be hand stitched. So that flag also is currently, uh, FEMA was very, generous to us and they gave us money to restore that flag. That's up at the textile conservation uh, workshop and they're restoring it. They're going to mount it on acid free paper. They actually, they put a metal backing on it so it, it can't move at all. So we'll be getting that back and I said, spoke to uh, Barbara earlier, when we get that back along with maybe some other flags, we can come down and do a flag presentation, maybe around flag day in June if you're not booked. So um, that pretty much concludes my talk, I don't know if you have any questions, I can certainly try to answer them. Um, about the Historical Society, we're always looking for members. <laughs> if, you, if you ever want to come down, feel free. Thank you. You can, uh, you can call me at home. My phone number is in the book, or you can call the Historical Society.
Humane Society. And we do tours all the time. We do group tours. So feel free to come down. I have the Bronxville seniors coming in March. They're going to bring their lunch. They're going to sit on the desks. We're going to give them the talk. And they're all going to bring a little hand lunch. And they're going to have lunch there. So, you know, we'd love to have you. Sheila, yes. did we ever put out a call for families to see if they have any antique toys in their okay. attic? I'm sure lots of people yeah. have we, You know, there's a do. constant flow of that coming into the society. And we used to get a lot of it from the barn sale, which we no longer do because we don't have the manpower to do it. Um, but for the most part, people are still very cognizant of the historical society, and we do get calls all the time. We, um, we recently uh, acquired a, I'm trying to remember what they call it, it's called a fire horn. And it's from the early 1800s, and it's a long, it's about this long, and it, it tapers out at the bottom, and it's all engraved, and I, I cannot recall the, the female's name that is on it, but it was typically given to, uh, it was a ceremonious piece that was given to uh, fire department captains or chiefs when they were retiring. Mm -hmm. So somebody actually came across this in their basement and gave it to us. So we, we do get things all the time. We do try to put the word out, though, and if people want, you know, mm -hmm. to dispose of Okay. And we'll come for a picnic in June. <laughs> and this is from us to you just as a thank you. It's amazing how many hidden treasures there are in our own backyards. Yes. Oh, one more thing. This was it. They forgot about this. This would be, this is called, does anybody know what they would call this quilt? A crazy quilt. And they would make these quilts from scraps of clothing. Um, you know, maybe your aunt's dress, your father's pants, your sister's bonnet. If you, if you fell and tore your pants or it didn't fit you anymore, they wouldn't throw it out. They would recycle it. They would cut them into scraps and they would make a quilt like this. This is an example of a bed that was typical to the 1800s. This is a mattress. Anybody want to guess what it's stuffed with? Who said it? Someone said it. Straw. This is a straw mattress. I'm going to pass this around so you can feel it. And this is the last thing. This is what they called a rope bed. And have you ever heard the saying, um, good night, sleep tight, yeah. Yeah. don't let the bed bugs bite. Yeah. The sleep tight part comes from the rope bed. And at the end, you'll see, you'll see little knots. So it was important to tighten this all the time. If you didn't keep these knots tight, the ropes would get, and then you'd end up on the floor. So that's all. Thank you. I'll pass this around if you want to see it. <laughs>